Welcome to another episode of the RAG podcast. And for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. Since early 2019, I've been interviewing the most successful and innovative recruitment owners to learn how they rose to the top of their game. In season seven, I'm going to be having raw, authentic and insightful conversations with agency owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, people across the industry. And I want to be learning about their ambitions, what's happening behind the scenes in their agencies today and their plans to navigate difficult market conditions. I'll be bringing you the latest and greatest recruitment stories every single week on Wednesdays at noon across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast. On this week's show, I am so excited to be joined for the third time by DSP. That is David Spencer Percival, the founder of Life Science People, a global life science people provider based in the UK with offices in the US, soon to be opening in Europe. These guys are 100 people, just under three years old. And I've had David on the show twice before. The first time they were on their way to 100 people flying. The second time, not so long ago, earlier this year, 2023, David talked about how They'd lost quite a lot of money in the in the downturn at the end of last year, eight hundred thousand in three months, um, and that the market just wasn't great. He was pretty honest that you know he wanted to wanted to have a show where he wasn't all about growth. He's like, this is how we've managed such a difficult economic downturn. However, he's back on this week to talk about the news that they've just secured four million in investment funding by Silchester Partners, who are a global um, hedge fund that you've never heard of. He said they're a quiet, discreet, private hedge fund who've taken 20% of his business for 4 million investment. That 4 million is going to skyrocket him for the next 10 years to get to 1,000 people. They want to make the Michael Page of life sciences. So in this show, it's a shorter episode, like just over 30 minutes. We talked about what he's done since, why he went through this process, why he felt the need to take the, the funding, how they got it over the line, what he's needed to do. And what he's going to do with the money. Um, he talks about de-risking and also having an epiphany moment that in the past, like this guy sold Huntress Group and Spencer Ogden. He, and he said he's done it too soon. So now he's on a much longer term trajectory than he was perhaps before when I spoke to him. Anyone who's looking to grow, scale, sell, exit, you've got to listen to this. DSP is an industry legend. And here's another great episode. So without further ado. David, welcome back again for the third time to the RAG podcast. Thanks, Sean. It's really great to be on. Thank you. I feel like I'm a. I feel like I'm on this morning now, and I'm inviting my favourite guest back. You know, I'm like, oh, come on again. It's Christmas. Come on again. It's Easter. Um, you're back for the third time. But uh, how have you been? Really good, actually. Yeah, we've uh, we've had a, a transitionary period. Um, yeah, I'm in really good spirits, actually. Really good. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, let's say anyone's picking up this episode for the first time, because there are people yep. that come. Yeah, just, I'm sure. Just yeah. do us a quick, for the third time, do us a bird's eye overview really quickly of who you are and what you do, and then we'll go into the story. Okay. I mean, uh, ancient history now was sort of uh, relative. Um, was, was a big biller in tech, um, set up Huntress with a group of people. Great project, took it to 100 million, 27 offices, 500 staff, sold it to a Japanese bank after seven years. Then I set up Hun uh, Spencer Ogden with Sir Peter Ogden. Again, amazing project, built it very quickly. You know, 0 to 500 staff, 15 very large offices around the world, got to about 130 million turnover, and it was sold three years ago to a private equity company. Uh, it was focusing on an energy and uh, really anything around the energy sort of market, so renewables, oil and gas, nuclear and stuff. Really, really great company. So I really enjoyed that project. And now... Cut to, um, we are three years next week um, starting Life Science People, which is uh, uh, just life sciences. It's our USP. We only do life sciences, all the uh, different sort of sectors within life sciences. And yeah, building uh, building nicely. Really, really going well. So if we backtrack a little bit, you first yeah. came on after about a year or so of the business and you'd grown, yeah. you, were, you were circa, I think, 60, 70 people. And yeah. then six months later or so, um, oh, no, no, you were about 18 months in. Then six months later, whatever, you came on and you said to us, look, you were pretty honest earlier this year that it's been a tough time. The market dipped. You said you lost £800,000 in three months, which is yep. a number that I've not forgotten. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that was that oh, was not a long time ago. So no. you, you were pretty open that, look, it hasn't been a, a, maybe the rocket ship growth that you had at the, in the first couple of years, but things are now 
things were you you said there was beginning to be green shoots again. That was the word yeah. that you used. It was beginning to be sprouts of positivity, and that was yeah. a few months ago. So you've now just announced four million of of investment. Um, yeah. To grow to a thousand headcounts. So talk us through what has happened since we last spoke. So um, we'll just talk about the market for a bit. Um, I, I guess it's, it's exactly a year ago to today that the market sort of plummeted in, 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 in sort of our kind of KPIs and stuff. And I think about, yeah. globally, you know, overhiring post-COVID, uh, lots of wage inflation. And then suddenly it just sort of dropped. You know, tech companies are coming out announcing massive uh, job losses and that sort of followed on with the market. And I think what we found was there was a massively frothy market um, previously. And then people were digesting all of the overhiring that they did. And I think recruitment companies took a battering. Um yeah. To be honest, I, I, I think we're still in that sort of market. I mean, it's a, it's a challenging market, but you sort of tend to normalize your business. You know, once you sort of cut what you need to as far as, you know, costs and staff and, and right size your business to the market needs, you know, it's very quickly became a, a client driven market. And we've had a candidate driven market for a few years. And, you know, you, you sometimes you have a lot of young staff who don't understand the, 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 the flip of the market, which happens quite quickly. So, yeah, you sort of spend your time right sizing the business, making some strategic moves and just getting yourself ready for, for the next uplift. Um, but, yeah, it seems to be dragging on a bit. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an OK market. I wouldn't say it's a good frothy market, but it's definitely very, very much client driven. So, yeah, it's been it's been so the market side of things hasn't changed massively. Um, but I think a lot of recruitment businesses have, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, closing offices, shutting down teams. I mean, I don't know any recruitment company that hasn't done that. Um, so yeah, market wide, I mean, we're in life sciences, which is fairly resilient. Um, but it's still been, been challenging and definitely, definitely client driven. So amongst all of that, um, I managed to, um, yeah, we, we got some enormous funding um, at a time, why? which was sort of, sorry? Why? So I, I, like, we could talk about the funding itself, but why? Yeah. Let's go back to the why. Like, when did you decide that you might want to do that? Because like, you already had a you know, you million quid of your own money in at the beginning. Two. You said you've got, a, you've got two million, sorry. You've got a healthy yeah. balance sheet. The business is profitable. You weren't like under, mm. from what I know, you weren't underperforming. No. So why would you go and do this? Like, what, what, talk yeah, us through it's this. It's an interesting question. Making, yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a moment where I thought, okay, do I continue funding this myself? Which is pretty heavy lifting, if I'm honest. You know, if you want to scale a business, particularly through a relatively challenging market, you've got to have pre pretty deep pockets. Um, and I thought, I actually wasn't looking. We, we were approached by two private equity companies. Um, one of them was the BGF Fund, which is Business Growth Fund. Br brilliant people. They back, you know, fast-growing UK businesses. But they're almost forced by the government to do it. They have, a, you know a couple of billion that they have to deploy um, post the financial crash. Great bunch of people started talking to them. And I think that's where the seed grew. I thought, what could we do with, you know, started off with like a couple of million quid. And I think what money does, it just makes it a little bit quicker and a little bit uh, less risky. So that, that's where it started. And then from that, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite an interesting story. I, I've known a guy for 10 years. He's one of the UK's highest paid hedge fund managers. Um, he has a, a fund, and actually, they're really not a hedge fund. They don't they don't hedge and they don't short. Um, they are a long term stock investor, but they've got like thirty seven billion under management. And I've known this guy for a long time. Never really discussed about funding or anything. And I went for breakfast with him, and he's very very interested in my business and, and what was going on. And when I told him about the private equity companies that were circling, he said, "I'd like to have a look at it." And it's very much outside of a hedge fund sphere to invest in private companies. But I've known the guy a long time and he knows me and he knows the successes I've had. And then cut to, we, we sat at this breakfast and the bill came and right at the end of the breakfast, and he said, I, I think I'd like to invest in your business. I said, well, that's interesting. And then one thing led to another and they invested four million pounds into it. But the, the key thing about this, Sean, this is a real game changer for me. This is a very, very, very bright person. 70 years old, consummate gentleman, very, very wealthy. He said, David, I think you're selling too early. He said, I think you build recruitment companies with a five-year plan. You execute it really, really well. He said, but you sell too early. If you carried on, you could build a, a Michael Page in life sciences if you gave it 10 years, not five. And he said, if you can commit to 10 years, we have very, very deep pockets and we could build a 1,000-person recruitment company um, if you would like to go on that journey. And 
it's the first time anybody's really sort of spelled it out to me that that is actually the right thing to do. I mean, whilst Huntress and Spencer Ogden were amazing projects, they did stop before they reached real fruition, I think. And you stop because ultimately you're spending so much money on growth that at some point you actually want to make some profits. You want to realize some of it, yeah. Yeah, so you stop growing. Spencer Ogden is a brilliant example. You know, didn't make a lot of money on the way up. Stop growing. You throw out 9 million EBIT. Um, so... I guess the concept was, wow, okay, I, I think that's a really smart idea. I think we have the sector. I think we have the vehicle. I certainly have the experience. And now this person was sitting in front of me saying, you know, we'll fund it. I said, who's, who's the business then that you that went into partnership with you? Uh, they're called Silchester Partners. They're a very, very discreet investment fund. But you won't see much in the press about them. I mean, the only time they're in the press is because they're the highest paid hedge fund managers in London. Um, they are very, very smart. They're very long-term view investors and they are the hedge fund you've never heard of <laughs> and you <laughs> like that. the hedge fund you've never heard of um well um what have you had to give away to get that uh 25 percent which is interesting because it valued the business post money at 20 million pounds which is a really good valuation for a sort of three years start you by post money you so by if you so 25 percent four million values the business at 16 million but when you put the four million into the business it values it at 20 Right, yeah, makes sense. So po they call it post money. So post money valuation is quite strong. But and how has he got to that valuation? Is that through EBIT? Is that through? No, it was it was because I I said if you if we we need four million pounds, we wanted to clear some of the debt that we put into the business in loan notes. We wanted to shore up the balance sheet, and we needed access to capital to build. Um, and that was why I thought it was a smart. And the re the reason I thought it was a smart thing to do was because the market right now is in free fall in many companies. And to be able to be sitting with a, with a pile of, of investment capital at a time where, any, where everyone else hasn't got that is the time you can make some real power moves in the market. I mean, you can start to, to acquire people, teams. You can strategically move into geographical areas where people are retracting. It's a really smart thing to do to invest where no one else is. It's risky. But ultimately, if you're looking at a long-term 10-year you know, 20, 30 million pound investment into a recruitment business to get it to a thousand people. Now is the time to start to make the moves you need to because you have access to capital and you have access to a market where people are genuinely concerned about the businesses they're in and looking to leave. But one of the things that I would see as an advantage right now, which I don't think you'll capitalize on unless you're changing your, your kind of ethos around hiring yeah. is the amount, of, the amount of available talent, right? There'd be a lot of good yeah. people coming out of companies that, that have got a couple of years experience. Are you going yeah. down that route or are you going to, because you've always been an academy so, train and what? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a hybrid, really. it's a combination. I think right. we'll always run academies. So our academies now are 12 to 15 people every quarter. I think I, I've said this before, it's, it's, a, it's a machine really. And they're good, they're good to have on board. I mean, they, they, waves of graduates over a two to three year period create your firepower and your future management team and, you know, they become the trainees and the billers and team leaders, the managers. It's a long-term kind of building because ultimately you can't find and you certainly can't build a large recruitment company based on existing talent. But if you add into that the ability to be able to afford to hire good talent as well, so, you know, contracts managers, country managers. I mean, we're launching Germany next week with a very senior German guy. Um, so we're putting a, a, a flag down in Germany. Well, then move down to Switzerland. I mean, each office can cost anywhere from 500,000 to a million pounds. So we're now looking to get our New York office open by the end of the year. So all of these things cost money. And then when, you, when you've got the senior talent and you're always looking for senior talent, you're then pushing through the graduate academies, which is building the business. But this all costs significant capital. You can do it slowly on less capital. But if you really want to take advantage of, of the current market and the current talent available, then you need capital and more capital than I had. Always willing to put in. Yeah. So you sat there with what, a circa 100 people now? Yeah. And you want to 10x the, the environment? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, over 10 years. 10x in 10 years. So is it, would it be a linear growth? You want a 200 next year? Yeah, and pretty much. I mean, it's very easy to sort of sit there and write you know, yeah. budgets and put in headcount and sort of get to a very nice juicy number. Ultimately, you have to execute that plan and that becomes sometimes opportunistic so you know if we come along 
So we, <laughs> I, put our, I, I very rarely post on LinkedIn. But I put our post on LinkedIn and said, you know, we've got 4 million quid, we want to hire some people. We now have 15 headhunters and rector rex signed up with terms, scouring the market. And we have under retainer exclusive to hire a New York office. So, you know, when you put that into play, you start, it's like a magnet, you start to generate sort of, you know, people coming to you because like not that many people are hiring that sort of, you know, um, the level that we're going to. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're sitting here with, it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So we've got lots of money, it's great. Yeah. We have a great plan um, to, to, to get to an end, an end game, but even that's not an end game, that's, just, that's that sort of, you know, to, to, that's not a complete project. Um, and the bit in between is is throwing up opportunity. So it's New York's a really good example. So we have some really good headhunters exclusively looking now for a New York team and New York around Boston. Yeah. Now that could take a month or it could take six months and you just have to be able to be ready to execute it once you've found your key people. The graduate academies, you can run as soon as you get going. You know, we have two trainers in America. We have two trainers here. We can deploy training and, and deploy you know, um, internal recruiters to find the graduates and, and you know get get people to find it. But when you get that key team in, they want they might want to move quickly, or they might not want to move to the end of the year and get their bonuses. So it's, it, it becomes a little bit more of a kind of strategic jigsaw puzzle. Once you want to say, yeah, I want to be in New York in January, I want to be in Switzerland then, I want to be in Miami then, it, it rarely works like that. So and sometimes the problem is you get opportunity from everywhere, and you can't you can't do everything at once. Um, and that's you know a nice problem to have, but it's also a problem. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a case now of, of, of carefully deploying the capital we have, making some pretty big strategic moves in the life science recruitment market, ready for what will inevitably happen, which is the upturn. Um, so but that's the plan. In that 10 that, years, you're going to see... In that 10 years, you're going to see, you're going to see an upturn and you're probably going to see another downturn, right? There's no doubt, yeah. 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 So you've, you've kind of got to be prepared that you might hit you might get to the thousand people or close to it and then it'll drop again and then it'll go Absolutely. again. Absolutely. And then again, you know, you have to cut cut again and go again. You know, it's a bit... <laughs> the problem with startups is they don't, they don't particularly have a very strong balance sheet, don't have a lot of money. If you're, a, if you're a sort of, you know, an NES or a Michael Page or a Robert Walters, you're probably sitting on 50 million quid on your balance sheet. You can, you can get hammered for a year, maybe two. Yeah. Um, you still need to make some cuts and make some, you know, some moves. But ultimately, you're going to you're going to survive it. Startups don't survive it. Small companies find it very, very challenging. So I think you know, once you're at a level where you have 500 recruiters, you can you can get hammered <laughs> because you can drop to 350, 400, and go again. Um, but you can't do that unless you're at that scale. So, but once you're at that scale, it becomes a little bit easier to weather the storm. One hundred percent, and. In terms of the team, talk a bit more about this team move strategy because that's something that yeah. you hear a lot. I used to recruit in insurance and yeah. that was a big thing in the insurance broking space where they yes. would underwrite and they'd go literally, the Lloyds of London syndicates would literally, well, they pay recruiters to rip yeah. out teams yeah. of six men and the money. I mean, it's a bit like legal as well. I think it happens in, in law. Yeah, yeah you it take, does. Yeah. You take a team from, I don't know, link late as well and an ovary and they're worth 10 million, this team. like, And it's yeah. big, big, it's big, big business. Team. It takes a long time. Yeah, teams are rare. Um, it can be done. I mean, you have to sort of circumnavigate contracts, employment, solicitation. You have to be very, very careful because you can't induce people to solicit teams of people. But if you're using headhunters, the headhunters can independently put a team together legally. Um, but, yeah, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's expensive and rare. But, you know, if you look at it in a terms of an acquisition, with an acquisition, you can pay 10 million quid for a 20-person recruitment company and you're paying a lot of money for goodwill or you can spend a million quid doing it you know, from scratch, um, they they come along. They do come along. They're, they're not they're not easy to find. But when they come along, you have to. You know, I've done it a few times at Spencer and Ogden. It's it's, it's it's doable, challenging, but doable. And are these people that you'd be going after already in life sciences, or would you take? Yeah, yeah. Life I mean, we are we are looking at tech into life sciences because it's quite a big market. Um, but I think we we've definitely sort of said to ourselves, look, we we're going to only look at life science people when it comes to experienced people. Um, because that is really, you know, I mean, that that's what we do. And actually it's quite, you know, tech recruitment is a little bit difficult and an energy to a certain extent. You, you can, you don't have to be a, an expert in it. Life science is complex. And it's complex because you're dealing with scientists and scientists are fairly about what they do. So you have to be able to know what you're talking about. So yeah, we, we are definitely only looking for life science people. 
the only exception would be uh, tech into life sciences because there's an awful lot of technology coming to life sciences. Yeah, like medical device tech. You know, yeah, I mean, it could be you know anything from a Fitbit to a, to a, to a piece of machinery or, or a clinical trial using AI. You know, there's a, the, the tech side of it. You know, is a wall of, of of sort of investment coming in. I mean, someone's calculated it's like a trillion dollars going into life sciences, of which about you know a, a third or even you know forty percent of that is in the tech side. Um, so yeah, it's it's a big market. Are you spending hours on LinkedIn and cold outreach and want more business coming to you over your competition? Well, if you're the founder or leader of a recruitment agency, here's what we can do for you. At Hoxo, we'll give you the training, support and resources to take you from what I call an offline recruiter, reliant on posting jobs and sending in mails to open up new customers, ultimately looking like every other recruiter on LinkedIn, to being an online recruiter, being seen by over 25,000 relevant people, driving a 200% minimum increase in engagement on your profile and seeing daily lead lists from LinkedIn that you can follow up with in six weeks time. And if you don't perform, you don't pay. Now, why can we make such a bold results-driven promise like this? Well, it's simple. There's two reasons. Firstly, whilst I've been building the RAG podcast, we've actually done what we say we'll do for our clients. In less than two years, we actually built a business generating from zero to over 1 million views per month on LinkedIn, leading to multi-million pound revenues with a sales team of me plus two people without making a single outbound cold call. Second is our track record. Not only have we done it ourselves, but we've helped over 350 agencies and over 4,000 consultants do it as well, it all in the last three years. Now, if that sounds of interest to you, click the link associated to this episode and we can book a call and tell you how we can help. Right, let's get back to the show. What does it mean for you as a leader now to have a, a 25% stake owned by a, an, you know, a private hedge fund? And what, what, yeah. what's going to change? Obviously, there's positives uh, to it. You've got a bigger balance sheet. You, got, you can grow. But what... Up until now, you, oh, you stayed yeah. into Percival's business, right? <laughs> yeah, quite right. Yeah. SP and LSP, it's like it, it just it, it just mixed yeah. together. I'll tell you what, there's, there's, the, the fours are you have um, partners who can bring a little bit of strategy, which you might not have. They can bring capital, which essentially is what was required to build businesses yeah. quickly and, and, and to grow them big. The downside is, of course, you know, you have a, you have a net, a non-executive director, Um it, it's it, you have to become a little bit more disciplined. I mean, you know, if the management accounts don't come out in the first 10 days, whatever, wait, yeah. wait for the next week, you know, it, it, it creates a discipline and actually it's incredibly healthy. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's particularly healthy for owner managed businesses to get too big because people learn their own fiefdoms. I mean, next thing you know, you've got a private jet on the company, it happens yeah. when you have investors, then you are it's almost like a sort of um. It's like a kind of um, discipline backup where you are aware that other people are shareholders and you have to respect that, you know. Um, and I think it's I, I think it's quite healthy. I mean, it, it really yeah, it doesn't phase me. And minority shareholders can make noise, but they're not an awful lot they can do when you own as much of the business as I do. Yeah. But equally, there is, a, there is an absolute respect for the fact that they are a shareholder. And... Ultimately, their reputation is on the line as well. I mean, this is a, this is a serious investment company. Um, and this investment was, I think, from I gather it was fairly unique for them. So it, there's a bit of a spotlight on us for that purpose. Um, but as I say, I, I think it's quite healthy. I think it's a really good discipline. I mean, you know, it's just is, is, is it what it sense, is. It? Yeah. It, but it's, it's a way up. You say, okay, do I take somebody else's money and be a little bit answerable to them? Or do I carry on on my own with my own money and you know, put everything on black. Yeah, I think for me, at this point, in, I mean, I don't think my, my our business isn't built in a way that I see the 10-year plan quite clearly as you. So I don't think if someone gave me that money, I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to use it in the same way. But um, the, the, the answering to somebody else is the bit that I think for now, I just wouldn't want. I think I love that. I being... I, they were very, very cool about that, I have to say. I mean, they basically said to me, look, it's your business. You run it how you want. We are benign investors. We're not interested in getting involved. We're not interested in making decisions. They're too busy. I mean, this investment, it's pocket change for them. They're a big hedge fund. They they, they trade 50 million a day. Um, yeah. So to put 4 million into a relatively small startup recruitment company is, is not really on their radar. So I, I can't imagine I'll be seeing a lot of them anyway. But ultimately, they made it very, very clear. This is your project. You do what you want. You do it. 
but you're the person who knows how to build recruitment companies. We don't. We're just the investor. So I think once you clear that... Done, though, what they've done is they've locked you in for 10 years, which perhaps you weren't locked in before. Well, it's, it's, I think that's a, yeah, clever I mean, move. that's a clever I move. Mean, they've, they've secured you. And actually, I think if I was working in, 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 in life science people... I'd be fucking buzzing because I can see now. Oh, the staff are loving it. I mean, yeah, yeah, because you're not we're going sitting anywhere here on, on, yeah, on, on, a, yeah. on a trajectory that many people aren't. I mean, it's great. Well, I it's, went out and met. I met the team in LA, didn't I? And I had a beer. Yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're wicked guys. And again, they're bought into you. The reason you know, yeah. Dan's gone out, yeah. he's gone out to LA, and it's because of you. And if you were going to be gone in two years, it's not yeah. quite the same journey. Well, well there's, there's there's plus and minuses. I mean, first of all, it wasn't a, genuinely an epiphany moment when. A, a, a super smart person who I respect a lot in business said, you're selling too early. You need to give it longer. You know, you're 52 now. Are you okay to do it till you're 62? Not, you know, you're not going to be like full on CEO, uh, yeah. cold face every day, but ultimately it's your business. And I think I just needed to hear it. And, but I did say to them, I said, yeah, I, I don't need to have another exit. I've done two. They're great. But you know, for me, it wasn't, it doesn't have the, um, the thrill that it used to. But my management team, who are young, you know, you sort of saw around the 30s mark, will need some liquidity in the shares that they have. I said, so that is my only problem with a 10-year plan, is 10 years is a long time for someone who's 30, to, to have some form of exit. It sounds it, but I'll be honest. I started my No, it goes before. quick, right? I mean... <laughs> I just turned 37 two weeks ago, and I'm like, fuck me. Like, that's gone so quick. Like, for seven years, when you're on something and you're in something and there's a goal... Oh, my God. Attached, so we've done three years already. That, yeah. Yeah. It isn't that long. It isn't that no, long. No, it isn't. I get but, your point. It's a lot different than saying to someone for five years. Conceptually, it's quite a long time. So yeah. they were... Because they're sort of, you know, a pretty bright bunch of guys, they sort of sat around and went, well, I think the best thing we can do is create internal liquidity for the shareholders. So they said, we have access to capital, or you will at that point anyway, because you'll be sort of throwing out some really, relatively decent EBIT numbers. He said, we can create an internal share platform where people can buy and sell them. And they said, if people want to exit, they can exit. You know, it's not a, you're stuck for 10 years before you get anything for your shares. They said, we can just create the liquidity. And it takes the sting out of trying to desperately get to a deal with private equity. And let me tell you, those private equity deals are torture. You've lost a year of your life in due diligence, doing going through the deal. You get the other end of it. Yeah, you've got some money out. But it's stuff full of low notes and debt. And, you, and it's very hard to trade out of that. So it was, it was literally a case of, uh, you're absolutely right. That is exactly what we should be doing with this business. And if we don't have the pressure of trying to build a business to be sold and we can create some kind of liquidity for the shareholders. I mean, they're even talking about, forget the option scheme. Let's make them shareholders. And then if they leave, they can keep the shares. They've earned them, you know, but you sort of scale it. to. to, to. So it was, I it just I just never thought about it like that before. After, would you believe, after 25 years? And it was just, that's, that's I thought that that's, and that's why I took, took the investment because actually, they have aligned what was really deep in the back of my mind to the forefront. And I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. So, yeah. What you've done is you've surrounded yourself with the right people. Like, even though you, yeah, yeah, you're 25 years, you've got one of the best CVs in the industry, but there's still things you don't know, right? There's, you Correct. don't know what yeah, you don't know. Well, so I don't, don't, know, don't, don't think about it, you know. Yeah. But you're not too, you're not, you've not got to the point where you think you know everything. And that, no, that's why you're, not, you know, that's why you're on the show. Sure, and, not, <laughs> why people want to listen to you, you know, because you, you, you're you open about it, which is great. Yeah. Um, So, I'm fascinated by this journey and I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, but I want, you know, you're going to be the first guy to get to like part 10, I think on this show, but what, <laughs> let's talk about part five, right? Uh, yeah. Sorry, part four, we're on part three. So if I come bring yeah. you back in, let's say a year's time in the summer yeah. of 2024, put it up, yeah. um, what does the world look like for you then? Like, again, I'm not holding you to anything, but what do you, what, what, what do we want to be saying? Where are um, we going to be? Let's, let's paint uh, that I vision will... of the company in a year's time. Well, first of all, I think we'll get the market a little bit more behind us. So I think it will become um, a little bit easier to make money, as it were. I mean, it's challenging now. I mean, we're fine. I'll tell you what's really interesting, actually. We had a board meeting uh, yesterday. And the number of jobs we are picking up has gone down. It's sort of, it's levelling, but it's not at the levels it was a year ago. But the really interesting thing about the statistics are that we are filling more of those jobs. So the fill rate which is the, the percentage of jobs that we fill, is climbing rapidly. So what that means is you've got a really good team of recruiters working for you 
who are finding it hard to find jobs because the industry is 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 you know not in, not in best of, of places, but they're finding jobs and they're filling them a lot better than they were. So they're becoming better recruiters, significantly better recruiters. So whilst you see this sort of jobs line sort of sort of drifting, the fill rate is going up really quickly, and that's really encouraging. So in a year's time, you would hope that with more jobs coming onto the market. You start to go more towards candidate driven. You've got a bunch of people that can fill jobs a lot quicker, a lot better, a lot you know smarter than they were. So you would hope to take advantage of the upside of the market. So in a year's time, market wise, I would see us as, as, as fleshed out into more sectors within life science because we're a little bit bunched in some of the main ones. But life science is a pretty broad church. I would expect us to be motoring in America. Um, I mean, we're going to be, we're at 20 now in LA. I'd be surprised if we weren't 30 by the end of the year. If you add in New York, we'll get up to 45, 50. We'll be looking at least sort of 50, 60, maybe 70 people in America by, by, by this time next year. Yeah. We would have fleshed out the um, German office, so that would be start motoring. We're looking at um, other parts of the, of the UK, only because of opportunity where people are, are actually geographically based, not to do with yeah. the market. And I think our London team will just continue to to, root, to grow um, in management and in graduates um, at, a, at a good sustainable level. I mean that that will be the plan. We may have opened up another another uh, uh, European office by then. Maybe I don't know if, if the opportunity is there. Are you looking at going towards like the Middle East or the Far East? Is that an option? Or? No, I mean no is the answer. Um, I think eventually I would be surprised if we went in Japan because Japan is actually quite a big life science market. Uh, I've never opened in Japan, so it's, it's completely alien territory to me. Uh, but it's a very big recruitment market, one of the biggest in the world. So if we do go that way, I think it will be over over a sort after sort of three or four years, and I probably think it would need some further investment, if I'm honest. Um, but we I think have a chat previously about. Did you have some? You've worked in the Middle East with the oil. Yeah, I had offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Perth, Malaysia. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm a fan to a point, but only if the market's there. I think it's a very, very different place to hire people. I mean, culturally, it's incredibly different. Um, but we we made a lot of money in the Far East, um, yeah. but it took, took a while. What about like Dubai and Saudi and that region? No, I'm not a fan of the Middle East. I, I had a Dubai office. Um, no, it's not, not for me. I'm interrupting today's episode to give you a message from our sponsor, Recruit Hub. These guys have now had 70 founders launch on their business, The Recruit Hub, in the UK, US, and UAE since inception. One of these founders was Stuart Mitchell, the founder of Hampton North in the US. With experience of recruiting in both the US and the UK, Stuart is a million dollar biller and he formed the business to tackle the biggest problem he saw in cybersecurity, which is the talent shortage. Moreover, Stuart felt like he'd ran out of personal growth. He wanted to do things his own way and put his own spin on something, become his own business owner. His advice for anyone thinking about starting their own recruitment business is the old Japanese proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. He said he regrets not doing this any sooner. It's a, re it's a really low risk situation because if you're an exceptional recruiter, all you've got to do is back yourself. I, having interviewed over 250 founders on this show, would completely agree with Stuart that the best founders are typically the best recruiters who back themselves and build off the back of that. So if you'd like to find out more about the Recruit Hub and Stuart's story, you can read the whole story and the information in the show notes. Click below. Right, let's get back to the show. And is that based on something specific? <laughs> let's just say it's a challenge collecting money. Yeah, that, well, that was what I was thinking, right? <laughs> say, especially Saudis becoming like, like, look what they're doing with the football market, right? They're buying, they're buying their way into the into yeah. the world of football. But the truth is, like, I mean, maybe they will prioritize paying Neymar and people and Ronaldo. But when it comes to general business transactions, apparently the the, the payment terms are incredibly late and well, well they're already I, long, I, and then they don't pay for another sixty days, or, and you end up with just a big big. Big book well, of business. No Burn for Spencer Ogden. You know, we had the Dubai office. I mean, if you're in oil and gas, you sort of need to be in the Middle East, don't you? Um, I find it very, very challenging. Um, I find them very difficult to do business with. Unless you're, you know, if you're part of that community, that's great. But if you're, if you're expatting people out there and trying to do business, I find it very challenging. But fundamentally, there's not a huge life science business over there, so it's yeah. just not. It's not on the map. Um, right. 
but certainly Far East in Japan is, is something to look at, but, but not for a while. I mean, we, we have a lot of work to do in America. So headcount in the next year then, at group level, what do you yep. think you'll be? Um, I'd like to be around 200, I think, maybe 250 if we, if we really, if the market's behind us, we'll, we'll, we'll put the pedal on the gas a bit, a bit harder. But I think the key is, you know, I, we, we, we spoke just, just before about the Levin group and, and Storm, you know, as I say, you know, I, I think they had a brilliant um, plan and very good funding and great execution, but I just think they got the timing wrong. And I think they probably felt a lot of pain as everyone did. I don't want to go too fast. And I want to deploy this capital quite carefully and strategically, take advantage of the market. Yeah. But I think you know, life sciences is is a, is a is, it's not a boom and bust market. You know, it's not fintech. It's not you know, oil price goes up, everyone hires like crazy. You know, life sciences is very very steady and grows incrementally with with uh, population. So for us, that's how we need to grow. You know, it's just just you know, we're not we've got ten years now. I'm in no, I'm in no rush. <laughs> it's mad. I mean, you you literally you know you say you're 52, but you're 52. Like, there's so much time. There's so much life. There's I know. So I mean, you retire, you die, right? <laughs> we talked about this. You know, you've got no kids. And I think that's the way you described it, I thought was so refreshing. You know, like, you just, it just didn't, wasn't for you. And like, you've, you've, you've been able to, you can live a life at 52. I don't think many people can because you can put your so much well, time into it. Yeah. I mean, I've started a new business at, at 49 or 50, or whatever it was. Um, I actually have a new partner now who does have children. So I've, I've inherited two, two, two great. I mean, I'm lucky they're sort of, you know, teenagers now. I didn't go through the tough bit. Um, my life has changed dramatically in many, many different ways. And yeah, I mean, some one of my best friends the other day said, you like Benjamin Button. He said, you're just getting younger. And what a great time, what a great thing to do, right? <laughs> you live so, in, yeah. Are you living with the kids as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it sounds like me, I mean, I, I've... Boy, can they I drink and party? In, <laughs> I moved in with, what was it, uh, September 21. So two years ago next month, I moved in with a what was what would have been a six and an eight-year-old. And now they're right. eight and ten, nearly nearly nine and ten. Yeah. And uh, I'd say it's been the hardest job I've ever had. Like, it's been amazing. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. But the yeah. hardest, you forget business. This has been harder, so much harder. Well, um, seems and I, yeah. I only had a couple of years of, well, I had a lot less time on my own and a bit out kids than, than you did, right? But I, yeah. I remember going from, I went from being in a relationship that wasn't working, being on my own, and then suddenly being in this household with two dogs, two kids. And it was genuinely, it was oh, hard it's to pretty, get my head around. It's pretty, it's pretty full on, yeah. I mean, when they're 13 and 16, um, but what I love about yeah. them is, you know, that they're, they're, I mean, when you're the CEO, people really tell you what they think about you and they laugh at your jokes, which is great. Um, but when you live with kids, I mean, they're like, you don't Dave, you're wearing them trainers today. Oh, they're really shit. You know? like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I turned up to my little lad's football. He, he went to a soccer camp the other day and I went at lunchtime to, to see him play because he's my mate who runs the camp. And he said, oh, we're going to kick. They're going to have a game at lunch and he's playing well. So I turned up. The first thing he said to me is, why are you wearing sliders? <laughs> um, kids are brutal, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. He's just, well, they're so grounded and... The energy they've got is amazing. You know, if you go, on, you know, went on holiday with them, and just just the pure energy that they have makes you younger. I mean, it is yeah, challenging; yeah. it can be quite full on. But I, I love it. But it's because I've never done it, before, it's all new. But you've also missed out. You have missed out on the addict. Yeah, time, where, like, <laughs> on the bit, Yeah, some of the things that I'm not even going to go into it, but some of the some of the toilet mishaps and things that happen in my household, you just like I genuinely didn't think about this. Like I didn't think about yeah. this. It's like. Wow, this is mental. They're at an age, mine at an age now, where they can get up, make their own breakfast, have a make yeah, a drink. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, they're definitely pretty self sufficient, but there's still yeah. babies at moments. Like they'll they'll burst out crying over. But, but it's energizing, right? Yeah, of course it is. I mean, and in it's, business, it's well, you know, doing anything new is energizing. You know, as long as it's not negative energy, as long as it's positive. I mean, this investment, I cannot tell you, Sean, it's transformed this business. It's transformed mm -hmm. me and the business. Because it was at a point, you know, it was, it was hard, really hard work um, and challenging. I mean, we were slogging it out. There's, there's no way we, we, we would capitulate to a bad market. But, you know, it's challenging. And then you get this sort of, it's like an injection of life into you with the ability to really take advantage of something and see clearly, clear vision of what's ahead. I think it's one of the best things in business. I mean, you did, obviously, there, as you said, there will be challenges. There's no doubt about it. But ultimately... It's, it's that clear vision and the systematic deployment of that capital, the growth, and just building and building and building. And you know what? <laughs> They're right. There isn't a Michael Page in life sciences, and there should be. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah. When it comes to, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not 
professing I know enough about this, but obviously AI is changing at a rate that we can't keep up with. Yeah. And if you listen to certain, like if you listen to Stephen Bartlett's Die of a CEO podcast with people like Mo Gowda. Yeah, yeah, he's right. You know, yeah, but it's also frightening what they're saying is going to change, Terrible. right? And it's the biggest yeah. threat to life in general, never mind business. So yeah. when you're sat there looking at a 10-year plan yeah, with a, an investor who's in his 70s, yeah, did that come up? Was that a conversation? Is that part of the conversation that, well, yeah, we can run a micro stage? Yeah, well, funny enough, because um, I've, I've known the guy for such a long time. We, we had had conversations previously about it. It didn't come up with this transaction. Well, it, it sort of did. You know, how, how will AI, AI affect recruiting? I think we, we, we're we all of the same opinion that I think it is challenging to an extent, but ultimately, I think everyone's panicking a little bit too much. I mean, AI is not that clever right now. It, it, you know, chat GDP, it can do stuff, but fairly rudimentary stuff. Not so they won't exponentially grow its, its ability. But I do think, and I've said it before, and I, and I genuinely agree, that it will be the commoditized markets. And, and that sounds awful, but, you know, when they say the loss of jobs, so you're going to lose, I don't know, 100 million jobs globally to AI. Well, you've already lost 200 million jobs globally to the automation of engineering in car factories. So, you know, this is just part of, of, of you know, civilization expanding its, its ability and knowledge. So the first thing you're going to find is that the commoditized stuff, call centers, stuff like that, They'll be the first to go, and that takes time of waves of, of stuff, and that will, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that will slow it down because people are so terrified about it. When you're talking about, I mean, we don't do a, we don't do a particularly sophisticated job, but we do a job that has a set of requirements and a set of, of, of processes. Those processes are awfully hard to, to 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 AI, I think, because you're dealing with people. You know, we're people dealing with people, dealing with people, putting people together. So much can go wrong, and whilst if you're looking for a, you know. A programmer with a certain set of skills, you don't care what they look like, don't care what, where they are, you don't, all you care is if they can program that. Yeah, I say AI can probably find that person for you. Yeah. But if you're looking for a scientist um, or someone that can sort of design or build or, or if you're looking for someone who's set up a biotech startup and needs to sort of build out the team, I don't know, that's pretty sophisticated stuff for an AI to, to do. So maybe it will eat away at the lower parts of the market. I mean, I've been in recruitment long enough to know when it when when the internet came out, like, that's going to finish recruiters. LinkedIn came out, that's finished recruiters. Recruiters are finished. Mm. You know, is it? I don't know. I mean, there, there's always a place for a there's delicate. Part of me that wants to, I want to believe what you're saying, but part of me is worried that we just have no idea how it advances. Well, system. listen, who knows? It could be the event horizon yeah. where we get taken over. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's my my big fear is like it. It's just it is Armageddon, right? But when it comes to business, <laughs> it's. it's some of the deep fake stuff that's possible in seconds is insane. I mean, insane to the point where like they reckon in a year or two, you'll be like, I'm a big video producer and I love standing on camera and stuff, but yeah. th there might be a time where any idiot could sit there, say their name and three words and then press a button and they write a, they, they input a chat GPT script into the video and suddenly they're on camera, they're talking, they, they yeah, nail yeah, the script. And you think, but don't wow. forget, but don't forget AI. Yeah, they could do that. They could, they could uh, emulate me and you. I mean, I, you know, you could AI you. I could be talking to a, to, to a, a chatbot right now with your face. I'm really here. Yeah, oh, yeah I'm here. <laughs> I am too for now. But it wouldn't be. A, it would be able to talk about recruitment. It might even be able to syndicate what we were saying over the over the last podcasts. But it wouldn't be th able to throw out completely random stuff. It just wouldn't. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I could say something now that no chatbot or AI could, could even think about saying. And that's when you know you're a human inter interaction. Yeah. I hope you're right. I believe, it, I believe in it too. And I really hope you're right. I just That was the only thing I was thinking. If you think of 10 years, that how fast and how different the world could be in 10 years. I mean, it hasn't well, changed. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure black cab drivers weren't expecting Uber to come along and eat their lunch, right? But there's still black yeah. cab drivers out there. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's in recruitment terms, when AI turns its eye to recruitment, I'm sure it's going to do some severe damage to recruitment agencies. But ultimately, I genuinely believe human intervention will supersede because there will be a point where people don't want to talk to an AI robot. And that is that will be the tipping point. That's why people get into black cabs and don't get into Ubers. You know, there is a whole raft of society that is so scared and terrified of it predominantly older people, let's be honest about it, you know, any, any young person will look at all their friends on a Snapchat map, map 
Whereas older people go, why do they want to know where, where everyone is? You know, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's a generational thing. The world is sort of run by the older people. So I think, I think we might get away with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might get 10 years out of it, yeah. Um, well, look, David, I think we'll leave it on that one. I think, look, okay. always a pleasure. You're an absolute legend. Um, honestly, Great the amount of people that say to me, DSP is a fucking, he's a legend. And he's like, he's, he's got, <laughs> he's, they all love the episodes. They love the charisma. They love the stories. So I'm, I'm bringing you back just for that. Um, Great. Yes. We, will, we will get you on, whether it be six or 12 months' time for part four, yeah. without a doubt. Well, it would be, um, be great to document and, and, and you know, the journey of LSP through, yeah. through this podcast, because it is a journey, you know, it really is. We'll be able to look back at it and go, what did he do there? What happened there? Where, where did they go wow. there? You know? I wonder how long my hair is going to be on the next one. <laughs> Mine's getting shorter. That's, 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 <laughs> I always get shorter. I get longer. Mate, thanks so much. I'm going to see you soon. Thank you as always for listening to today's show. I truly hope that you got value from it. Honestly, it's the only reason I take time every week to ensure that my audience, you guys, future and existing recruitment owners, you're learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. And today's episode is brought to you by my business, Hoxo. I'm the CEO and founder, and we're on a mission to help brand recruitment agencies and their people better. I wanna help people have the tools to stand out in the most competitive markets in the world. We're currently working with over 350 recruitment agencies and 5,000 of their consultants right now, helping them to build their personal brands to consistently win more business, attract talent, and just become that go-to recruiter in the market. Now we do have a huge coaching program, but a lot of people don't know, we also manage the brands of a lot of founders and we can do the rebrand of that company organizational piece as well. So if your recruitment agency either needs help to look and sound exactly how you want it to, or your leadership and consultant level need to get out there and drive more traffic back to that website, to the business and start using LinkedIn to generate more revenue, then you should definitely be reaching out to us. If that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean, a personal message on LinkedIn. I love hearing from RAG listeners. I would love to talk to you. Uh, look forward to it. So I'll see you again next week with another episode. Catch you soon.